Simonon's Maigret, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simonon. With Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simonon. Now read that, George. Just read it. Latest positions in the Tour de France. What? After the first stage of the race, the Belgian No, 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 cyclists. no, not that. The report of the killing at the Porte d'Orléans. They got everything wrong. The name of the victim, the name of the street, even the name of the police inspector in charge of the case. You don't like crime reporters? Well, bad ones, no. The good ones, yes. Yeah. Rougeau, now. Rouge, ah, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> there was a man worth his salt. Never printed anything unless he was certain of his facts. Or thought he was. Are you thinking of any particular case when you say that, Jules? You know exactly what case I'm thinking of, George. Makery sets a trap. Translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods. Now, he was the reporter who scooped the story of a Montmartre killing. Yes, and deserved to. It was a sweltering hot August, if you remember, and most of the reporters preferred to stay in the Brasserie Dauphine rather than hang around the Quai des Orfèvres. But Rougin thought he was onto something. I'd stuck at it, sitting outside my office, sweating like a pig, with nothing to drink except lukewarm water from the tap down the corridor. But at least he was there when La Pointe came to see me. When he brought in... Suspect number one. Uh, uh, <laughs> with La Pointe's jacket over his head to hide him from anyone who might be curious. Well, that was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Rougin was straight on to him. Ah. Uh, who is he, Inspector? I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to say. Oh, come off it, La Pointe. Where does he come from? Where did you pick him up? It's far too hot to be bothered with your questions, Rougin. Ask Chief Inspector Maigret. Ah, so that's where you're taking him. Thank you. Is he a suspect? As I said before, I don't know. How many murders have there been in Montmartre? Or five over the course of six months. All women, all stabbed to death. All of them had their clothes torn methodically. All of them had superficial lacerations. Nothing stolen? No. Well, it must have been about... 11 o'clock at night, when I finally sent Paul Lapointe and the other chap, uh, still with Lapointe's coat over his head, <laughs> off in a car. <laughs> but when I left the office, there was Rougeau, still waiting, still sweating, refusing to let up while he thought there was a story around. Ah, evening, Chief Inspector. Are you still here, Rougeau? Who was it? Uh, who? The chap with Lapointe. Ah, uh, sorry, I can't help you. Uh, try again tomorrow. It may be cooler, then. Will you make a statement tomorrow? Mm, I don't know. Has he got something to do with the Montmartre killings? Um... Uh, no. Sorry. No step. Thank you, Chief Inspector. Good night. And uh, what did he print? <laughs> Killer caught at last. Is this the Montmartre maniac? And of course it wasn't. No. <laughs> he was a delightful fellow called Mazet. I needed a man whose description would be as unimpressive as possible and whose face wouldn't be known to the public or the press. I was setting a trap for the real killer, and I needed bait. What gave you the idea in the first place? Well, the previous evening, Madame Maigret and I had been out to dinner with Raoul Pardon and his wife. And afterwards, I was talking with a fellow guest, Professor Tissot, who was the director of the mental hospital in the Rue Cabanis. Ah, yes. Mm. He was a very interesting, intelligent man. Doesn't your responsibility frighten you sometimes, Chief Inspector? Hmm? Oh, you're referring to the Montmartre killings? Yes. I wouldn't like to be in your place with the 
public getting panic-stricken, the newspapers doing nothing to reassure them, and high-placed persons with their own ideas of what you ought to do, all cancelling each other out? <laughs> that is the correct picture, I take it. Yes, it is. What makes you think they're all the work of one man? Well, when there's a series of crimes, as on this occasion, the first thing we do is to look for what they have in common. Such as? Well, the time, for one thing. Hmm. Now, in this case, the first attack took place at 8 o'clock in the evening, and it was February, so it was dark by then. Now, the crime on March the 3rd was committed a quarter of an hour later, and so on, until the last one in July, which took place a few minutes before 10 o'clock. Now, obviously, the murderer waits for darkness and then attacks. Uh, what about the dates? Ah, well, I've gone over them time and time again. First of all, people talked about the full moon. Oh, they always blame the moon when they can't think of anything else. Do you? As a doctor? No. As a man? <laughs> I don't know. Ah. <laughs> In any case, only one of the attacks took place when the moon was full. And there were no other common factors, not on any particular day of the week, nor during any particular part of the month. Mm. So we looked for something else. And, and the first constant that we hit upon was the district, Montmartre. Now, the murderer obviously knows that area well, and that's why everybody thinks he lives there. And that means everybody is suspicious of their neighbours. We've received hundreds of letters describing the strange behaviour of perfectly normal people. Uh, you said the district was the first constant. Yes, because the women all lived in Montmartre. They came from different parts of the country, and from the occupational point of view, there was no resemblance between them either. Prostitute, midwife, dressmaker, post office clerk, and a housewife. Uh, but they all lived in the district? Yes, but it's unlikely they knew one another. More than probably they'd never met. We checked to make sure they didn't all attend the same church, go to the same butcher, have the same doctor or dentist. No constant? None. So I looked at their photographs. Uh, you've seen them in the papers? Yes. Mm. Well, something suddenly struck me. Now, if you don't look at the women's faces, just their figures, you'll notice all five were shortish, rather plump, thick waists, broad hips. Well, it could be a coincidence, but I think it's unlikely. Oh, you can't very well put a guard on every short, plump girl in Paris. <laughs> Quite. Mm. Well, anyway, that's as far as we've got at present. You know the question that worries me most, Professor. Hmm? This man is no longer a child. He must have lived for quite a number of years, 20, 30 or more, without ever committing a crime. Yet, in the course of the past six months, he's killed five people. Now, how did it all begin? Why did he suddenly change from a, a harmless citizen into a dangerous maniac? You know, Monsieur Maigret, uh... A lot of lunatics or semi-lunatics are sent to me after they've committed crimes, and in nearly all of them, I found a conscious or unconscious desire to assert themselves. Mm. Well, nearly all of them, rightly or wrongly, had for a long time been regarded in their own circle as unstable, second-rate, mentally retarded, and felt humiliation as a result. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that the majority of crimes, which are said to have no motive, and uh, repeated crimes in particular, are a manifestation of inadequacy, if you like. Oh, yes. Yes, that, that fits in with something I've noticed over the years. Oh? Well, if criminals didn't sooner or later feel the need to boast of what they'd done, there wouldn't be nearly so many of them in prison. <laughs> it's a form of vanity, isn't it? Huh? No, oh, I don't mean to say they give themselves away on purpose, but nearly always, as one crime follows another, they take fewer precautions, as though they were defying the police, defying fate. Uh, right. Some have admitted it came as a relief to them when they were finally arrested. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, Professor Tissot, what would happen if someone else were arrested and took the place of our killer? as it were, usurping what he regards as his fame. Well, your killer would have a feeling of frustration. And might kill again? Almost certainly. Professor, you've given me an idea. 
The man's pride in the crimes he has committed may be our best chance of catching him. Inspector's room, Luca speaking. Yes, that's right. What division are you from? Ah, yes. You're to cover the Rue Colancourt from the Place Clichy to the metro station. Dress as inconspicuously as possible and carry a gun. You've met the police women who are acting as decoys in that area? Good. Good. Well, just remember, they're to be protected at all costs. You're on duty from 8 o'clock, but uh, we're not expecting anything before dark. Good luck. Well, that's the last of them. How many does that make? Uh, 174 plainclothes officers, 20 short, fat policewomen acting as decoys. <laughs> God knows how many were standing by, and all on the off chance that our pet murderer might decide to have another go tonight. Yeah. So... Now it's over to you, jean -Vier. I shall just sit here as befits an officer of my age and position while you and the rest of the youngsters dash up and down Montmartre trying to look like civilians. Well, let's hope you catch him. You sound doubtful. Never count your chickens, Lapointe. Where's Yobby? Oh, I'm with the chief inspector in a patrol car. No, oh. teacher's pet. Now look, jean -Vier. All right. It's all right. Still don't see how the chief can be sure this man will attack one of the police women. Or that he'll attack anyone at all. Well, his theory is that now all the papers have said we've caught the murderer, the real chap will be so furious he'll kill someone else, just to prove he's still on the loose. Well, it's a long shot, but it just might work. Pretty risky long shot. What happens if the man succeeds? Right, come on, Lapointe. Let's get started. Off you go, jean Vier, and good luck. Chief. Got your gun? Uh, yes, sir. Look out for the shop, you car. Lapointe. Okay, Chief. Good luck, Chief. Uh, what's the time, Lapointe? Uh, oh, it's half past ten, sir. Mm. I'm still as hot as ever. Yeah. So far, nothing. Back to the Place du Tap, driver, and then follow the same route again. Very good, sir. And when we get up there, Lapointe, go into one of the cafes and telephone Luca. See if he has anything to report. Right, sir. Luca. No, Lapointe, nothing at all. Just a prostitute complaining a foreign sailor had knocked her about. From the sound of her voice, I don't blame him. Oh, uh, tell the chief that reporter's still here. Yes, Rouge. I think I'll move a bed in and charge him rent. Good hunting. What's the time now, driver? Four minutes to eleven, sir. He's probably not even in Paris. Probably on holiday. By the sea. Brittany. Cooler than it is here. Why did I start all this? No reason, just intuition. I'm talking to Professor Tissot. And conceit. So sure I was right. So many people risking their lives. And the man with a knife. Eleven o'clock. It's been dark for practically an hour. Nothing will happen. Just as well, perhaps. Well, there's no news, sir. Thank you, Lapointe. Off we go, driver. Same route, Yeah. No, wait. Switch that engine off. Where's that coming from? Far side of the square. Down towards the Avenue Juno. Step on it, driver. Right, sir. Stand back there, stand back. Now, you're the one who was attacked? Yes, Chief Inspector. Name? Policeman Jusserand. Ah, at least it was one of us. Are you hurt? No, sir. I'm, I'm all right. I'm just a bit shaken, that's all. What happened? Well, he came at me and 
I just couldn't hold him. I'm sorry. Oh, it doesn't matter. They'll catch him. He can't get far. I've got this, sir. Oh, what is it? It's a button. I must have torn it off his coat when I was struggling with him. Oh, uh, something. Now, I want you to give me as accurate a description of the man as you can. Well, it was so quick, and as you can see, it's pretty dark. Yeah, but do the best you can. La Pointe. Yes, Chief. Listen carefully to this policewoman's description of the man and get it circulated as quickly as possible to everyone in the area. Yes, sir. And then, policewoman Jusserand, I'll take you back in my car to the Quai des Orfèvres. Maybe. Jovier here, sir. Yeah? The chase is still going on. They surrounded a good part of the district. I'm in a cafe on the Place Constantin Pecqueur. And as I got here, I'm practically certain I saw the fellow running down the steps opposite. Well, you weren't able to catch up with him? No, sir. I got after him as fast as I could, but he had too much of a lead on me. Well, why didn't you shoot? Oh, I didn't dare, sir. Mm. There were too many people about. I might have hit one of them. But uh, apparently, just before I got here, a man came into this cafe. He didn't stop for a drink, just made a telephone call and then went out. Ah, uh, well, nothing else? The barman said he was fair-haired, youngish, slender. His suit? Dark. Mm. My idea was that perhaps he rang up somebody who came with a car and picked him up. I don't think they're stopping cars with more than one person in them. Well, then tell him to. Right, sir. Well, there we are, Luca. The policewoman he attacked reckons he was about 30 years old, thin, looked like a gentleman, and she remembers when she grabbed his hand, there was a wedding ring on his finger. Now, Jean Vier is just chased and lost, someone who fits that description. Apart from the button, that's the lot. Any report on that button yet? Uh, yes, sir, just come in. The lab says it's a good quality one, and from the piece of cloth still on it, the suit was of expensive material. Mm. Imported. Probably English. So, they give me the lists of cloth importers and button makers. Quite a few of them. Hmm. Well, that'll give La Pointe and Jean Vier a nice little outing tomorrow. If we haven't caught our men before then. So, after a late night, poor La Pointe and Jean Vier had to trail round hundreds of cloth importers and button makers the next morning. Well, not that many as it happened, Georges. For the first time in the case, luck was on our side. The second button maker La Pointe and Jean Vier visited recognized the button. Oh, yes. This comes from uh, Mullerbach's at Colmar. Colmar? Uh, Do uh, Mullerbach's have a Paris office? In this building, as a matter of fact. Two floors up. Thank you. Uh, what exactly did you want to know? Did your firm make that button? Yes. Have you a list of tailors to whom you sold buttons of that kind? Of course. Uh, Monsieur Jean Fils? Will you look up the reference for this button and bring me the list of the tailors to whom we sold that type? There were 28 of them, and that was only in Paris. A sizable number. Why? So La Pointe and Jean Vier decided to split the list in half and tackle 13 apiece, each clutching a part of the cloth torn by the policewoman from her attacker's suit. Was luck still on their side? Well, not quite so speedily, but eventually Jean Vier came across a tailor who recognized the cloth. Yes, this is one of our materials. Why, do you want a suit? Uh, no, but I would like a list of the customers for whom you've made a suit in this material. Well, there's only been one recently, and well, even that was some time ago. How long? It was uh, last autumn. You remember the customer? Oh, yes, indeed. I made the suit for him myself. Who was it? Monsieur Monsin, uh, Marcel Monsin, a very nice gentleman. I've made his clothes for several years now. Does he live in the district? Yes, uh, I have the address somewhere. Chief, Jean Vier here. I found him. Yes, he lives in the Boulevard Saint Germain. I'm just opposite the house now, in a cafe called the Solferino. What, Chief? Order you a beer. Very good, sir. Oh, thank you for the beer, Jean Vier. Never told to you. And congratulations on finding him. You're always supposing it isn't one of the other customers on one of the other tailor's books. Monsieur seems to be the only one in this area. Near yeah, where the murders took place. Yeah. Well, we'll soon know. Yes. Is Monsieur Monsin at home? I don't know. If you wait a moment, I'll go and ask madame. What is it, Odile? Two gentlemen who wish to speak to monsieur, madame. Yes? Is your husband in, madame? Yes. But he's asleep. I must ask you to wake him. 
May I ask who you are? Judicial police. I'm Chief Inspector Maigret. This is Inspector Janvier. Oh. You'd better come in. Uh, thank you, madame. That will be all, Odile. Yes, madame. This way. Uh, thank you, madame. madame. I suppose your husband came home late last night. What do you mean? Does he usually sleep until this hour in the afternoon? Often. He likes to work in the evening, sometimes late into the night. He is an artist. Uh, then he didn't go out last night. Not that I know of. If you'll wait here, I'll go and tell him. Uh, thank you, madame. Whew. I wouldn't mind a flat like this, mm. chief. Work hard at your job and never question your superior, Jean Vier, and who knows. Yes, Chief. And on the other hand, you could marry a rich woman. I don't know any. Mm. He'll be here in a moment. Marcel is curiously shy in some ways. I sometimes tease him about it. He hates to be seen when he's just out of bed. You have separate rooms? Oh, do a lot of married couples, don't they? Your husband works here? Yes, his office is through there, overlooking the boulevard. He works a lot? Too much for his health. He's never been strong. We should have been on holiday in the mountains now. We always go at this time of the year. But he's accepted a commission that will prevent us taking any holiday at all. Ah, mm. oh, here he is. I will leave you gentlemen alone. Mm. Thank you, madame. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, gentlemen. I was working very hard last night on an absolutely vast house a friend of mine is building on the Normandy coast. Otherwise, I would have been up to receive you. I must apologize for being obliged to ask you some personal questions, Monsieur Monsin. If I can be of any help. To begin with, I should like to see the suit you were wearing yesterday. My suit? How extraordinary. Well, if you would care to come through into my dressing room... Thank you. Uh, you must excuse the rather untidy state of the room. I was working until two o'clock this morning. That was why I was asleep when you arrived. The maid hasn't had a chance to clear up as yet. No, please don't worry, monsieur. Now, Chief Inspector, that is my entire wardrobe. The uh, grey suit is the one I was wearing yesterday. I see. Mm. Have you got that bit of cloth, jean -Vier? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, now, last autumn, your tailor made you a suit in this material. Do you remember it? Yes, indeed. Well, what has become of it? Someone standing on a bus platform burnt the lapel with a cigarette. You had it mended? No. I gave it away. I hate anything that's not perfect. Always have. Even as a child. I took it out with me one evening when I was going for a walk by the Seine and gave it to a tramp. Was this long ago? The evening before last. I see. Have you been married long, Monsieur Monsin? Twelve years. I got married when I was 20. You're an architect. Architect decorator. Uh, that means, I suppose, that you're an architect who specializes in interior decorating. Not exactly. Uh, do you mind explaining? I'm not allowed to draw up the plans of a building because I haven't actually a degree in architecture. And you don't need a degree to become a decorator. Mm -hmm. Do you have a great many clients? I prefer having a few clients who trust me and give me a free hand rather than a great many who would demand concessions. You were born in Paris? Yes. Whereabouts? At the corner of the Rue Coulancourt and the Rue de Mestre. In Montmartre? Did you live there long? Until I got married. Are your parents both alive? My mother only. You're on good terms with her? My mother and I have always got on well. What was your father's occupation? He was a butcher. In Montmartre? At the address I gave you. And he died? When I was 14. And your mother sold the business, eh? She put a manager in for a time and then sold the shop, but kept the rest of the house. Mm. She has a flat on the fourth floor. Monsieur Monsignor, I'm afraid I have to ask you to accompany my inspector here to the Quai des Affaires. Is that necessary? I'm afraid so, jean Sir? I'll be back there as soon as I've had a word with Monsieur Monsignor's mother. Right, Chief. Now, Chief Inspector, what exactly do you want with me? You saw your son yesterday evening, madame. What have the police to do with my son? Please be good enough to answer my questions. Why should I have seen him? 
I imagine he does visit you now and then. Often. With his wife? I fail to see what that has to do with you. No, did your son come here yesterday evening? No. Nor during the night? He is not in the habit of coming to see me at night. Are you or are you not going to explain the meaning of these questions? I warn you, I shall answer no more of them. I am in my own home, and I can remain silent if I choose. Uh, Madame Monsin, I regret to inform you that your son is suspected of having committed five murders in the past few months. What did you say? We have good reason to believe that the five murders committed here in Montmartre were his work. How dare you? Your son has not been here within the last 24 hours. No. When did you last see him? I don't know. You don't remember his visit? No. Tell me, madame, when he got married, was it with your approval? Yes. I was fool enough to... To arrange the marriage? Oh, what does it matter now? And you're no longer on good terms with your daughter-in-law. What has it to do with you? That concerns my son's private life which is nobody else's business, neither mine nor yours. Have you arrested Marcel? He's in my office at the Quai des Affaires. I want to see him. Of course, Madame Monsin. Monsieur Monsin, you have a visitor. Don't be frightened, Marcel. I'm here. Mama, they shouldn't have if brought you, like you here. No, oh, they didn't. I chose to come. What are they doing to you? Just asking questions, Mama. They're mad. I tell you, they're mad. But I shall get the best lawyer in Paris. I don't care how no. much he wants. I'll spend my last penny if necessary. I'll sell the house. Beg on the Hush, streets. Hush, Mama. Yvonne knows you're here? She knows, Mama. Then where is she? What did she say? No, if you'll please sit down, madame. I don't want to sit down. What I want is to have my son back. Come, Marcel. We'll soon see if they dare to keep you. I'm sorry, madame. So, you're arresting him? I'm keeping him at the disposal of the law. Now, will you be good enough to sit down and answer a few questions? I shall answer nothing. Don't be afraid, Marcel. I shall take care of you. <laughs> Your mother seems to be very fond of you. I'm all she has left. Come in. Yes, Jean-Vier? Sorry, sir. I didn't realize you had someone with you. Oh, that's all right. Uh, call Lapointe. Lapointe? Yes? The chief wants you. Yes, chief? You take Monsieur Monsin to the cell. See that he's comfortable and has anything he wants. Right. Uh, this way, monsieur. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. Now, young Jean-Vier. We found that fellow's suit, chief. Huh? Or at least the jacket. Where? Well, uh, we picked up a tramp who was wearing it down by the Seine near the Pont d'Ossolitz. Says he found it on the river bank. When? This morning at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the trousers? Uh, they were there too, but he was with the pal. They divided the suit between them. We've not got the one with the trousers yet, but it won't take long. Is there a cigarette burn on the lapel? Yes, but I took it up to the lab and Moet says that burn isn't more than 12 hours old. Mm. So, Monsin's story about it happening on a bus a couple of days ago is a lie. Mm -hmm. Ring Madame Maigret and tell her I'll be in for dinner tonight. Right, Chief. I'm just going to call in on Monsin's wife. Haven't you brought him back? No. You really believe it was Marcel, don't you? One day you'll see you were mistaken, then you'll be sorry for the harm you're doing him. You love him? He's my husband. Have you arrested him? Uh, not yet. We're going to question him again tomorrow. What does he say? He refuses to answer. And you're sure you have nothing to tell me, Madame Monsin? Nothing. You realize, don't you, that even if your husband is guilty, as I have every reason to suppose, he will neither go to the guillotine nor to hard labor? I have no doubt the doctors will say he's not responsible for his actions. But five women have died so far. As long as the killer, the maniac, call him what you like, remains at liberty, other lives are in danger. Perhaps tomorrow he may begin to attack the people around him. Aren't you afraid? No. You see, you believe he's guilty. I know he's innocent.
Uh, is that you, Chief? Uh, who, who's speaking? The plant, sir. Hmm? I'm sorry to disturb you. Yeah, I'm sorry, too. I was fast asleep. What's the time? Half past twelve, sir. Oh, the Lord. Where are you? In the Rue de Mestre. There's just been another killing. What? A woman. Stabbed several times. Hmm? Her dress slashed. When did it happen? About three quarters of an hour ago. I'll be there. So, another killing. Yes, and in a way, it was my fault. This time it couldn't have been Monsin, because he was safely tucked up in the cell. And as usual, no one saw the crime being committed. No one. But I had my own ideas about who might have done it. But it shouldn't have happened. Anyway, I made certain arrangements and was in early at the Quai des Orfeaux for the next morning. Are they here? Uh, yes, Chief. We put them both in the interrogation room. Did the sparks fly? They just took one look at each other, yep. sat down and shut up. Oh, what are we to do now, sir? Oh, for the moment, nothing. Now, you go and sit in the next door office, Jean Vier, near the communicating door. Mm -hmm. If they decide to talk, try to hear what they say. Right, Chief. And Luca, uh, Chief, have some of these newspapers taken into the two women. Let's put them on the desk, but make sure that from where they're sitting, they can both see the headlines about last night's murder. Right, Chief. La Pointe? Chief. Where's Monsa? I put him in your office, as you told me. Oh, uh, uh, good. Now, don't disturb him. Good morning, Monsieur Monsa. You've been informed of what happened last night? No one's told me a word. Then you'd better read this. As you can see, someone is doing their utmost to save you. It's a pity it's cost another innocent girl her life. Your mother and your wife are here. They'll be brought in presently and you can have it out among yourselves. Nothing to say. Nothing. Don't you think it's about time you put a stop to all this? Don't you think this makes at least one crime too many? If you talked yesterday, this one would never have been committed. It was nothing to do with me. Oh, yes, it was. It was everything to do with you. Which of them did it? I don't know what you mean. Hmm. I've looked through all those photographs of you your mother has piously preserved in her flat. Dozens of you. Hundreds. But none of your father. I don't even know what he looked like. He was a tradesman, wasn't he? A butcher. I suppose your mother was ashamed of him. Were you? How old did you say you were when he died? Fourteen. And after that, mother took over. Didn't you ever have a desire to rebel against all the fussing and mollycoddling? No, I suppose not. You didn't rebel because you're lazy and vain. Some people are born with a title, money, a servant. You were born with a mother who took the place of all that. Whatever might happen to you, mother was there. And you knew it. You could do whatever you chose, and the only price you had to pay was obedience. You belonged to your mother. You were her property. You weren't allowed to grow up into a proper man. Why did she marry you off at the age of 20? The fear you'd begin having love affairs? I have nothing to say. Have you ever had anything to say off your own back, I mean? I don't imagine you married because you were in love. You're too self-centered for that. You married for the sake of peace and perhaps to get away from your mother's influence. And then your wife turned out to be as possessive as your mother. Why didn't you rebel against her? Both of them were preventing you from being a man. Oh, I'm going to send down for a beer. Do you want one? I don't drink. Oh, of course not. How many times have you wanted to kill them? I don't mean the poor girls you've been attacking in the street. I mean your mother and your wife. You were the prisoner of the both, weren't you? They fed you, looked after you, spoiled you, but at the same time they owned you. You were their creature, their property, something they fought over. So, 
How could you assert yourself? Not in your profession. You were an amateur. No one took you seriously. That's clear about it. So how were you to assert yourself? You had to do something outstanding, something everybody would talk about, something to make you feel superior to the common herd. You couldn't kill the two of them, although I imagine you'd have liked to, because that would have been too dangerous. The search would automatically have led to you, and in any case, there would have been no one left to back you up, flatter you, encourage you. But it was them, the domineering females you resented, so it was females you turned on, in the street, in the dark, and then tore their clothes afterwards to prove what a man you were. You didn't rape them, of course. You weren't man enough for that. Luca, send down for a beer, will you? Very good, Chief. One or two. Just one. No more, sir. I shall remember you all my life. Never before in the whole of my career has a case bothered me so much. When you were arrested yesterday, neither of those women thought you were innocent. And one of them decided to save you. If it was your mother, she had only a few steps to go to get to the ruler mast. If it was your wife, it means that on the assumption that we would release you, she was prepared to spend the rest of her life married to a killer. It could be either of them. The one who committed the murder knows what she did. The one who is innocent knows that the other is not. I wonder if she doesn't feel a certain jealousy. For years, they've been competing to prove which of them loved you most, which of them possessed you most completely. And how could either of them possess you more completely than by saving your neck? Come in. Yes, your beer, Chief. Oh, you'll drink it, new car. I'm going out for a breath of fresh air. When I get back, tell Jean-Vier to bring the two women in here. You'll be glad to see them, won't you, Monson? You've been away from them both for a whole day. I don't know how you manage. Chief. Ah, come in, mesdames. Please sit down. Oh, uh, shut the door, Jean-Vier. Uh, don't go. I shall need you to take notes. Right, Chief. Please. Now, I'm not going to try and deceive you into thinking that Monsin has confessed. Well, how could he? He is innocent. No, madame. Whether he confesses or not, he has committed five murders, and you know it. <sighs> Both of you. Because you know his weaknesses better than anyone. Sooner or later, it will be proved. Sooner or later, he'll end up in prison or in an asylum. Never. One of you took it into her head that by committing another murder she could avert suspicion from him. All that remains for me to do is to find out which of you last night stabbed a certain Jeanne Laurent to death at the corner of the Rue de Mest. You have no right to question us without a lawyer being present. It is our right to have legal advice. Now kindly sit down, madame, unless you have a confession to make. How dare you? You're behaving like a boor, which is what you are, a boor. Please, mamma. Now if you continue to make a scene, madame, I shall have you taken away by an inspector who will question you while I deal with your son and daughter-in-law. Oh. Thank you. I'm convinced that not only did one of you hope to save Monsan by committing a crime similar to his while he was in custody, but that also one of you had known for a long while what was going on. The time this latest murder was committed, the stabbing, the slashing of the clothes, all that was identical with the other crimes. But there was one difference. The girl who was killed at the corner of the Rue de Mest was tall, slim, totally unlike the other victims. Did neither of you notice that every woman Monsin struck down was short, plump, similar to yourselves, Mena? Mm. Or were you unwilling to admit that every time he killed, he was, in his mind, killing one of you? trying to assert his right to some sort of freedom, some existence apart from you. Do you still think it was worth either of you risking your necks to save such a man? Although I suppose you're regarded as preserving what you consider to be your property. 
I am perfectly willing to die for my son. He is my child. It doesn't matter to me what he has done. And it doesn't matter to me what becomes of the little tarts who walk the streets of Montmartre at night. You kill Jeanne Laurent? I do not know her name. You are responsible for the murder committed in the Rue de Mest last night? Yes. In that case, can you tell me the colour of the victim's dress? I... it was too dark to see. She was killed less than five yards from a street lamp. I didn't pay attention. But when you slash the material? The colour, madame? The dress was blue. Oh. Yes, your daughter-in-law is right, madame. Yes, it was blue. Et bon, Monsa, you admit to the murder of Jeanne Laurent? Yes. You finish it, Jean Vier. You know what to do. Right, Chief. I'm tired. I'm going home. Uh, wouldn't you prefer to use the other door, sir? That reporter's still out there waiting for you in the corridor. No, that's all right, Jean Vier. Rougeon. Rougeon, wake up. Uh, what? Oh, I'm sorry, I must have dropped off. Yes, I think you must. Oh, I didn't get much sleep last night. No, this corridor isn't the most comfortable of places. Any statement, Chief Inspector? Hmm? Oh, why not? Let's go down to the Brasserie Dauphine, Rougeon. The chairs are softer, the beer's cold, and I can tell you all about his income. Oh, wow. And that was how Rougeon scooped the story. Yes, I should have waited, of course, given an official release to all the papers at the same time, but after all, Rougeon was there, and I was tired. I'm not surprised. I don't think I've ever been so tired. <laughs> after I talked to him, I went home, lay down on the bed, and slept. Woke about six that evening, and took my wife to the pictures. To escape, relax, in a way. I just felt I wanted to rub shoulders with a few human beings again. Convince myself there were one or two still left. In Maigret Sets a Trap by Georges Simenon, translated by Daphne Woodward and adapted for radio by Aubrey Woods, Maurice Denham played Jules Maigret and Michael Goff, Georges Simenon. Luca was Brian Haynes, La Pointe, John Rye, and Jean Vier, Sean Barrett. Monsin, Malcolm Reed, his wife, Margaret Robertson, his mother, Gladys Spencer. Tissot, Patrick Barr, Policewoman, Francis Jeter, and Rougin, Christopher Bidmead. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman.